The A1, Britain's longest road. Stretching almost 400 miles from the city of London to the heart of the Scottish capital. Connecting two nations and passing through 18 counties, it's an unrivaled highway used by hundreds of thousands of vehicles every day. We're going southbound down the A1 on the northbound carriageway. But not all journeys go to plan. I thought I'm going to lose my life. Cars are coming close. It is the dangerous place to be. Lives can hang in the balance. The rear end of that vehicle, it's unrecognisable. This is actually the bodywork of the car. 24 hours a day. It's not a safe place here. There's a team of people who keep us safe from harm. The police. People Response teams. We don't know whether they've got the road closed or we don't know what's happened. And traffic officers. Better keep going. Keeping Britain's most iconic road. Get out! On the move. Substantially damaged flatbed truck in lane two. The A1. The monster that it is, it'll, uh, it'll start to return to normal. Coming up, a pile up on the carriageway. Planes one and two are blocked, so effectively the A1 North is shut. Puts lives at risk. Substantially damaged flatbed truck in lane two. Highway overload. And this is uh, very dangerous. That could burst at any time. As officers clamp down on illegal vehicles. As it stands, we cannot permit this vehicle to proceed on its okay. journey and fires on the Tyne push police officers to the limit. There's a lot of explosives within a car. Really, really dangerous. With hundreds of thousands of vehicles using the A1 every day, keeping the only continuous road between Edinburgh and London moving is a 24-hour operation. And over in Sproprah near Doncaster, an early shift is just about to start. It's just before 7 a.m. and traffic officers Paul Day and Rob Larkin are heading out onto the A1. Out of Charlie Echo 13. Within minutes, there's a report of a crash near Pontefract, 11 miles north of their base. Multiple vehicle RTC, possible injuries. Vehicles are still in situ across the uh, across the road. There's lanes uh, one and two are blocked. Yeah, lanes one and two are blocked. So effectively, the A1 North is shut. Priority at first attendance is we make the scene safe, we then check for people's injuries, organise ambulances, etc., if needed, and then we deal with the trap traffic and anything else that's going on around us. But the, the priority is to make the scene safe and then open at least one lane as quickly as possible. The crash involves a truck, so there's a chance the victims could be seriously injured and with traffic still speeding past, all the other motorists on the A1 are also in danger. They're looking at this traffic and just not seeing us behind trying to make his way. Every second that passes, the jam is getting longer, and this increases the risk of another pileup. Right, shall we just stop everybody here, get us a gap? Yeah. Right. One, three, we've just stopped the uh, traffic. The traffic officers are the first on the scene. They've no idea how badly injured the drivers are. One three, uh, substantially damaged flatbed truck in lane two. Bear with us, we'll see if we can move that once we find out if there's injuries over. Is anybody injured? Um, I'm, I'm fine, I wasn't involved, but these guys, are you all right? Uh, bit, I think it's just sprained in the air, like it's nothing serious. Need an ambulance? No. no. Right, is that your truck? Yeah. Will he drive at all? I'll come back to you, bear with. These drivers have had an incredibly lucky escape. Anybody in this? Yeah. Yours? Yes, it's mine. Any injuries? Uh, just back up a little bit. And, yeah. Do you need an ambulance? No. The next priority is to clear the scene and to get the A1 moving again. What we've got a minute is we've got traffic stopped. And you saw what it did in nine minutes. Because we've got it fully stopped now, it's not even making any progress at all. So the importance is get it safe, get it open as quick as possible, allow people past, which will not take long now. 
But what Paul and Rob don't realise yet is that the stricken vehicle in Lane 2 is a hybrid electric car which could still be live. This incident is about to get a lot more challenging. One of the most southerly sections of the A1 is where it intersects the M25 in Hertfordshire. Tens of thousands of vehicles travel on this stretch every single day. But some simply aren't fit to be on the road. In Hatfield, Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency officer John Windybank is on patrol and on the lookout for unroadworthy vehicles causing danger to other road users. It could be a vehicle that looks like it's heavy or in poor condition. And it's not long before he spots a truck that could pose a serious risk to other motorists. It looks like a three and a half ton scaffold vehicle in lane two. It could well be overweight, it will, it will depend. Overloading of vehicles is quite a common occurrence with us. It's probably something that we come across every day. If you were in that vehicle and you had to brake suddenly, then it, you're not going to stop. So you're just going to plough into the person in front of you. So, I mean, it's possible that this vehicle may be OK, but looking at it, it may well not be. It's John's job to escort the vehicle into a waybridge at the side of the A1, where a team of his colleagues are waiting to take a closer look. Right, what I need you to do first, can you just reverse that to get your back wheels off the plate? Dangerously overloading a vehicle is a serious offence. Last year, more than 70 people faced prosecution for this crime. Right, if you stay there while I collect the weights. While traffic examiner John Blyde weighs the vehicle, his colleague Prem Kumar has concerns about the state of the truck. What happened to the windscreen? Uh, yeah, funny, so it was my first day that was. Right. I put the radio on the dashboard and it did a little kink. Yeah. How long has it been like that? A week. A week. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a bit of trim hanging off here as well, isn't it? Okay. Rear lamp cluster broken. Do you know when it was last serviced? No. And Prem spots another reason why this vehicle is dangerously unroadworthy. Found a defective tyre, so defective that sidewall on the tyre has become damaged and it's caused a, a bulge to appear. That could burst at any time. This is uh, very dangerous. As it stands, we cannot permit this vehicle to proceed on its journey in this condition because there's an imminent danger of this exploding. All right. And that's not all. John has the results of the weigh-in. OK, guys, so you're a three and a half thousand kilo truck and you're coming at 5,600 kilos. You are seriously overweight. You're just over two tonnes overweight. It means the driver or his boss could be heading to court. I've got to say to you that uh, you do not have to say anything. It may harm your defence if you fail to mention your question something later on in court. Well, you can do say maybe given it evidence. The vehicle is unfit to go back on the road and will be immobilised. It concerns me that, you know, people don't know the danger they put themselves into or other road users. If we weren't doing these checks, this, these vehicles would just be running around on the public highway. I mean, the last thing we want is people killed. And with many more vehicles still to check, the team is in for a very busy shift. The A1 passes through 15 different police forces, more than any other road in the UK. Police officers patrol night and day to keep traffic moving and motorists safe. In Northumbria, PC Alan Keenleyside has just received his latest call. Yeah, do you think I need to walk you down, walk down, walk down, driver. Alan never knows what he will be faced with, from car fires to criminal activity. What we've got now is we've got a pursuit. Alan is pursuing a driver who has failed to pull over when asked to stop by the police. He's ignored sirens and flashing blue lights. When a car fails to stop, you've got to think there's a reason for that. It could be a stolen car, it could be a disqualified driver. The driver could be under the influence of drink or drugs. So when you've got a vehicle that fails to stop, it's inherently dangerous. 
The last report was going over this roundabout. By the time Alan arrives, the driver has been stopped by an unmarked police car. He's now being questioned by police. Just make sure everything's all right, mate. That's all yeah, Alan gets an update from fellow traffic officer PC Gary Morris, who'd also joined in the pursuit. Then you saw him. Perhaps he was just hoping that if um, you just ignored him, he'd give up and leave him alone. The driver in our car is compliant, um, so we'll just hang back here, mix dealing with him. It's pointless going down there and, ag ag and aggravate the situation that doesn't need to be aggravated. Police discover the driver hasn't got any insurance and doesn't even have a driving licence. He's not passed a test, so he's not shown that he's actually got the ability to drive a car safely. Um, if he's on a provisional licence, he's obviously got to be displaying L plates. And he's got to be accompanied by a, a suitably qualified driver uh, that, that's keeping him right on the road. Uh, and he obviously, to do that, he's got to be uh, insured as well. If he was to have an accident with anybody, somebody else is obviously going to perhaps suffer an injury or damage uh, and they've got no, no recourse against the driver of this car. By not stopping when he was asked to, the driver made a dangerous situation worse. And he's now going home without his car. So what's going to happen now? We've confirmed that this vehicle has no insurance. The driver of the vehicle is a provisional licence holder, so the driver's been interviewed to be reported to court for those offences. And this vehicle will now be seized by us, and when the driver is able to produce the relevant documents, he's got a licence and insurance for this vehicle, the vehicle will be returned to him. He's got to do that within seven working days. If that doesn't happen, the vehicle will be disposed of by means of crushing, or if it's over a certain value, it'll go to auction. Uh, and be auctioned off. So, um, good little result, and another vehicle off the road this morning. Back on the southern edge of the A1 in Hatfield, the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency team is still on the hunt for dangerous vehicles. Examiners have pulled up another van they suspect may be carrying an excessive load. This can be deadly, as stopping speeds are dramatically increased when vehicles are overweight. Good morning. Morning. How are you? What? And what's the name of the company you're working for? What's your name? Sorry? It's on the side of the van. Vehicle examiner Vicky Foster is keen to quiz the driver. OK, if you can just park for me. Yeah. Uh, just in the lane next to this vehicle. Yeah. And then I'll be over to you in a second. As Vicky weighs the vehicle, driver Robert is worried about the outcome. I put some stuff in this morning that's going to a scrapyard, so, you know, a lot of it you can just take out and it'll be underweight. But then, you know, the, the penalty is you can't do the job you're expected to do. But it's not good news for Robert. It's a three and a half tonne light goods vehicle and it's coming over four and a half tonne. Unfortunately, you're 33.71% overweight, and because of the, the amount of the overweight, it's not a fixed penalty, it'll be referred to court. OK. So I'll be conducting an interview with you under caution. Yeah, whatever. OK. Robert will now have to remove all the excess weight in his van before he's allowed to drive any further. It will affect stopping distances, it will affect the braking and the steering and, and handling of the vehicle. It puts the general public... Um, at risk. Back on the A1, John Windybank is on patrol. Part of the officer's job is to spot check European lorries to ensure their paperwork is all in order. But now he spotted a vehicle with markings he doesn't recognise. I believe it's Spanish. It's quite a newish vehicle. He decides to pull it over for Vicky and the team to have a closer look. I'm just indicating to come off at the junction. He's indicating, so he's totally compliant. Hello. Hola. It's funny, it's funny. When did you come into the UK? Did you come ferry or train? Uh, train, train. train. Uh, do you have your ticket? Ticket. La luce, OK. Although the truck passes as roadworthy, <laughs> There are other concerns. The maximum a goods driver can work is 56 hours in a week with regular breaks. So Vicky wants to check his tachograph. So I'm just looking at the driver's hours just to ensure that they've had enough daily rest, enough weekly rest. The results don't look good. At the moment, we've got some infringements regarding weekly rest. Driver has had two reduced weekly rests back-to-back -back, and he's driven for seven days. 
Driving when tired puts everyone at risk. This trucker will receive an on-the-spot fine and be banned from driving for 45 hours. Problemo. Problemo. Yeah. OK. Penalty for you, £300, prohibition, uh, no driving, 45 hours. OK. Yep. It's a very good result. The drivers are, are now uh, going to be rested when they start driving again. There won't be a risk to road safety and are unlikely to cause any accidents on our roads. It's obviously a huge danger to the general public, road safety. Uh, the driver's overtired, he hasn't had sufficient rest. Fall asleep at the wheel, they crash into oncoming traffic. And I certainly wouldn't be, want to be in the car in front of him or any of my family either. Pinpointing problems along this 400-mile-long road is a relentless daily task for the teams that patrol it. Now on a two-lane section of the A1 close to Newcastle, PC Alan Keenleyside is on his way to a reported car fire. These calls are classified as Grade 1 emergencies. It means there's an immediate risk to life. Okay, historically, with older cars, you used to get a lot of uh, vehicle fires, but uh, but certainly of late, the way the cars are nowadays, uh, vehicle fires are getting less and less. Alan's first impressions at the scene are reassuring. There's no smoke and his colleagues seem to have the situation under control. Is everything all right? Yeah. Right. Good. I had a report that the car was smoking as well. Yeah, it's a clutch, it's gone. What's it? They, they think it's the clutch. Oh, the clutch. It's a real smell of burning coming from the car. You see the clutch pedal's completely gone, so it uh, looks like the clutch cable snapped. It's gonna, it will be a recovery from here, all right? Agnes and her husband, Robert, have been to pick up their son's car. He'd left it at work last night to go for a drink. We picked it up for him as a favour, and we were just taking it to his home. He's just sorry it was, you know, we were stuck with the problem, you know? Agnes had only been driving it for a few minutes when it started losing power. Luckily, her husband was following behind. Just I was driving along and the car was making very loud noise when I changed gear, so I pulled in. One of the options is, your good lady and you could jump into your car, nip up to uh, the shopping park here, grab a coffee or something. The RAC will give you a ring when they're a couple of minutes away and you can meet them back here with the key. Car fires used to be a common occurrence. These days, though, they're rare. Once upon a time, a car would catch fire reasonably easily. Um, but now, because of the way vehicles are built, you know, the, the fuel cutoffs, the, the insulation, the, the fire suppression systems in vehicles, um, fires aren't as common as what they used to be. A lot of people mistake vehicle defects for vehicle fires. You know, if the, um, if the brakes are binding on a vehicle, if there's a collision, the airbags go off, people say the vehicle's on fire. But actually, it could just be a mechanical defect. So I, th I think everybody, when they see smoke, they revert to worst-case scenario and shout vehicle fire. So, uh, but, you, you know, we'd never blame people for that. That's, that's a human reaction. But ultimately, you've got to have an open mind when you respond to these incidents. But not every case turns into a false alarm. It's 3 p.m. and just as Alan is heading back to the station, he finds himself in the middle of a real emergency. Are you all right if this flows? Are you all right if we keep this lane flowing? Yeah, yeah. What's You're happy with that? Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. The fire service were on the scene within minutes, but Alan still doesn't know if anyone's been injured. Toy have got complete closure. Uh, northbound Pontelan Road at the minute. Lane one southbound is passable. Uh, so traffic is going to be very busy in this area now. Just let the form know, please. Have you got the fire brigade up there with you? Carl, yes, yes. They're, um, they're extinguishing the fire now. They're in lane two, southbound. I don't actually know where the, uh, where the owners are around here. It's a dangerous situation on a busy road. The team need to extinguish this fire and find out what has happened to the driver. On the northbound stretch of the A1 near Pontefract, Paul Day and Rob Larkin are still at the scene of a multi-vehicle pileup. 
The road has been closed and rush hour traffic is now starting to build. It's causing stop-start traffic further south, which is a severe risk for other drivers. Non-injury crash, lot of debris, lot of mess. So what we're doing, clear up as best we can, make, make scene safe, allowing traffic to run past in lane two. That should be a good one then. Luckily, the damaged truck is still drivable. By moving it out of the second lane, there's a good chance that it can be reopened soon. I'm just putting out lane one closure, because we've got the stricken vehicles in lane one. Once we've got this in place, we can let this traffic go past the senior lane two. I'm just waiting for Paul to finish sweeping up this debris, and then uh, we should be good to go. The A1 has been completely closed for about 10 minutes, causing huge tailbacks. But thanks to Rob and Paul's swift response, one lane can now be reopened. Rob has some bad news that will mean a big delay to reopening the other lane. I've just discovered that uh, one of the vehicles is a hybrid vehicle. When they're hybrid, we won't recover them because there's a chance the bodywork could be live, so we leave it to the uh, recovery agents to do that. While they wait for the recovery truck, Paul offers the drivers some advice. If you can give your details to each party, if yes. you sew it, yeah. for a witness, yeah. job will be a good one from us, I can, you can go then. OK, cool. All right. You two, have you exchanged details? No, not yet. No. No. Right. If you can write name, address, contact number down of the driver or your company, but I need the driver's name yeah. and contact number, yeah? Yeah. The situation is made all the more dangerous because of the exact spot where the accident has happened. We've just, just been on the viaduct, there's no hard shoulders. There's no hard shoulders, no effort to go. So we just have to uh, cone out behind it like we have done and get traffic flowing past it in lane two. Yes, it does cause a minor problem, but it's nothing that we can't deal with. Meanwhile, the delays mean the tailbacks keep on growing. We've been here probably 40, 50 minutes. Um, we initially stopped traffic, which creates a bit its own issues and backlog. We've had an update that the, the impact of the traffic is back at least two junctions, which takes it down to Doncaster Road. That then is probably six miles. It is flowing past, but we've got quite a considerable amount of uh, traffic backlog. Both ways now, because people are looking. 20 minutes later, though, the recovery truck arrives to pick up the hybrid. By now, the tailbacks are nearly five miles long. I'm sure you've already noticed, mate, but it's an hybrid, so we don't know whether it's live or not. We'll, we'll leave it to you. No worries. I'm going to try it at first uh, to see if it's live. If it's not live, we'll just leave it dead and I'll just put it on with slips. It should hopefully ever shut down on it, which will disable our system. So we'll take it from here, we just get stuck in and just go for it, get this motorway flowing as quick as we can. With the hybrid safe, it can at last be taken away. And finally, Rob and Paul can open the second lane and traffic can begin to get back to normal. It's always important to get a lane open as soon as possible and then to clear it as soon as possible. It does back up daily. But with the Zam's one lane shut here as well, that would, that would have impacted on it quite significantly. If it had not been an hybrid, we may well have been able to drag it off network. Just around the bend is uh, a bit of an hard standing. But uh, with it being hybrid, we couldn't touch it. Three counties north in Tyne and Weir, Traffic Officer PC Alan Keenleyside is still dealing with a serious car fire. The blaze has been going for 15 minutes. Thankfully, the driver of the car, Jennifer Mountain, has been unharmed in the incident. Are you all right, first and foremost? That's the important thing, all right? That can be, well, I was going to say that can be fixed. It can't be, all right? But it, it's insured. What about recovery for this? Do you want us to go ahead and get that organised for you? Yeah. OK, all right. Thanks to improved safety systems and better engineering, car fires on this scale are rare. But when they do happen, they can have devastating consequences. The A1 is literally just over that roundabout there. So as we've been on the A1, seen the big billowing smoke. We've come off the A1, we've only come about 100 metres, 
Fire Brigade were already in attendance and they very quickly got this fire under control. It's really, really dangerous around a car fire. There's a lot of explosives within a car. You're talking the, you know, the bits that hold the bonnet up, you know, the airbag firing mechanisms and the like, you know, really, really dangerous. When the fire started, Jennifer was going to pick up her son from school. So come up the hill. Yeah, and it just uh, stopped working, so I put my hazards on and then it set on fire, so I ran out. You have all the best, we'll take care of your car, we'll get it away. As Jennifer heads off, Alan turns his attention back to the clear-up and the possible cause of the incident. Right now, we need to get this lane reopened and get this traffic flowing out of Newcastle as quickly as we possibly can. The A1's going to be affected as well, so back to patrol and that, making sure that's there, uh, run as it needs to be. Thankfully, the Tyne and Weir Fire Service got to the scene quickly and managed to put out the flames, but reopening the road won't be straightforward. We're getting the car recovered, but even if the car's recovered, we're not going to be in a position to open this road, and that's because all this metal is just melted in, it's molten into the road surface. And we'll ha this happens a lot at road traffic collisions, where if, if you get a big collision, we clear the accident, but the road remains closed because the local authorities sometimes have got to dig the road up and relay it before it can be safely reopened. It's still smoking, that. It's still smouldering. 45 minutes later, a truck arrives to shift the burnt-out car and council workmen can start clearing up the road. Needs a new arrow. You're not going to wipe in, are you? Tibex? Tibex. <laughs> Much to the relief of the people trying to get home, the road won't need completely resurfacing tonight, meaning traffic can start flowing again. We've had a look at it with the engineer, and the road's ready to be reopened, so all this traffic back and about of Newcastle towards A1, we can get that going again. It's right on Russia now, it's 20 past four, so uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's go away and get these people, these good people of Newcastle home. With traffic moving once more, it's been an eventful end to the day, but it could have been a whole lot worse. That lady, thankfully, she didn't have any kids in the car with her. You know, there was just her as a driver, an adult driver. She was able to get out straight away and get herself safe. She's on her way to pick kids up from school, so she has got a young family. If that car had caught fire 10, 15 minutes later, it would have could have been two kids in the back seat. So you've got a car on fire, you've got to move the seats forward, you've got to get people out the back seat. H horrendously uh, difficult to do, so yeah, she's been lucky. Further investigations revealed the car fire in Tyne and Weir started after a major electrical fault. The uninsured driver's car was later scrapped. The motorist received eight points on his licence and was fined more than £1,250, including costs. And the driver of the overloaded truck was interviewed under caution and is due before magistrates.